Welcome to another edition of Fit and Fire. I'm Mark, and I really appreciate you guys stopping by. As always, I just wanted to say thank you to everybody who is supporting the channel. It really means a lot. And one of the things that I also like to do is I like to support some other channels as well. This past week, I was honored enough to be invited over onto the Firearms Radio Network and specifically onto their podcast which is called This Week in Guns. Uh, so basically this podcast just talks about major headlines that are going on in the 2A community, gun community, and a couple other things that uh, we can kind of feel good about and then some of the stuff that we need, really need to talk about. So what I'm going to do is I'm just gonna add that on to the rest of this so you guys can check it out. I'll put a link to all of that stuff down in the description below. So if you're not familiar with the Firearms Radio Network or with This Week in Guns or We Like Shooting or any of those other podcasts that they have the live stuff up on YouTube, you can go check that out. So I'd really appreciate it. It was a lot of fun. I sure do appreciate them having me on. And uh, here you go. Without further ado, hope you guys enjoy. See ya. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are those of the individual co-host and do not reflect the official policy or position of the Firearms Radio Network and or their employers. Viewer discretion is advised. This is especially true on our live shows. Broadcast for shooters, hunters, and gun enthusiasts. This is the Firearms Radio Network. The bandwidth for this episode of This Week in Guns is sponsored by Patriot Patch Company. PatriotPatch.co Welcome to This Week in Guns. This show is brought to you by the Firearms Radio Network and Patriot Patch Company. And the show offers commentary on the latest firearms industry news, information, and buzz. I'm your host, Sean Heron. And as always, I get the pleasure of introducing our panelists tonight. First up, we've got historical firearms researcher and host of C and Arsenal's Primer, Small Arms of World War I series, Othias, back in the house. What's up, buddy? Hey, how's it going? Next up, newbie to the show, Metro Atlanta law enforcement officer, USPSA and GSSF competitor, Kayla Bodrin in the house. What's up? Hey, guys. Welcome. Uh, Mark from Fit and Fire, I see you everywhere now all of a sudden. Uh, all of a sudden. Still the YouTuber combining guns, gear, personal defense, and fitness to promote a free and active lifestyle. Mark, welcome to This Week in Guns. Hello. Thank you for having me. <laughs> I love it. Before we get started and get right into the show, guys, let me just uh, say thank you to our advertisers, Patriot Patch Company, uh, their Patch of the Month Club. I've actually got one of their awesome cleaning mats right here, the 1911 series. Brand new, just showed up in the studio yesterday and I uh, love those t-shirts, all kinds of other stuff. The Patch of the Month Club, one of my favorite things ever. So go to patriotpatch.co to check that out. And then we've also got Manicore Arms in the house, uh, providing comfort products for all the guns that you probably already have, AKs, ARs, uh, Brins. AUGs, AKs, I think I already said, Scorpion Evo, Tavor X95, Tavors, all kinds of stuff out there. Uh, check out their Transformer Rail. It's one of my favorites. Manicorearms.com. Coupon code is TWG10. And guys, we're going to get right into it. Uh, turning gun buybacks around. Group uses money earned from selling useless guns to send kids to the NRA gun camp. This comes to us from the truth about guns. It's, it uh, takes place in Illinois. And this group basically goes in, turns in garbage to the police buybacks, gets a bunch of money, and uh, they brought home over $6,000 to send kids to NRA camp. Pretty freaking awesome, in my opinion. Thoughts, guys? Anyone can go. <laughs> well, I read through the article, and uh, first of all, I think it's great that they want to take what is sort of considered to be a bit of a virtue signal, a bit of a non-answer for a gun violence problem and they want to convert it over to something that is productive for gun accidents because i find that training and expanding the culture especially understanding of the culture is the number one way to prevent accidents especially with youth so i don't see any problem with taking a buyback program and utilizing it to further train kids and then if you're the buyback and you think that all guns out there are dangerous then you should probably be pretty happy with this sort of compromise, which is that you get like that particular gun off the street. And then as a consequence, the money you paid out, well, it doesn't go to the movies or McDonald's or anything else. It goes towards the further education of someone who's going to be responsible with their firearms. That should honestly be common ground. But uh, reading through it, I believe they said they had some controversy with it. Did they not? Yeah, yeah, he did. Uh, the, the cop didn't take a lot of his guns. He tried to take a picture of some of the stuff that was on the table. And uh, one, 
uh, maybe it wasn't a cop actually one of the administrators there uh, got mad at him told him he was never welcome back to another one if he saw him that he was going to turn him away uh, sternly is my assumption and um, yeah uh, I, I agree with what you say man uh, taking kind of a useless virtue signal type thing and turning it into something good uh, Kayla any any thoughts on this one um, I do I think that one of the main goals of this buyback program is to get guns off the street and reduce crime. Um, but I think it actually does the opposite. One, the guns that are you know being turned in are non-functional, most of them. And a lot of them, I think in turn, it actually increases the crime rate because when you look at any people are out to do whatever they want to do to make quick cash. Um, so you have entered autos that come in, let me steal all these guns, break into houses, break into cars just to get quick cash because pawning them leaves a trail. So it's more dangerous to do that. This is a buyback, no questions asked. Um, so I think you have that problem that comes with this along a, obviously criminals don't turn in the gun. So it's not their The purpose for this program, I think is flawed, obviously. Yeah, for sure. Mark. Well, I, I find the pure uh, irony in the whole situation that uh, this is allowing individuals to sell money uh, or sell guns uh, back to the state and local governments uh, and then utilize that for training, which which uh, was mentioned before, which is a great, great thing. But you're also talking about the state of Illinois. Illinois is probably one of the most uh, backwards states when it comes to a number of different issues. But specifically, you know, you look at Deerfield, Illinois, with the um, new policies that they've enacted I believe it goes into effect on the 9th of June where, you know, they, they just assume take all guns away. So I, I find it, I find it just completely ironic and I just, I, I just chuckle at the whole thing. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, the crazy thing is if they get a gun that was actually used in like some kind of mass mass murder or something and uh, you know, you you don't get in trouble with these gun buybacks, yeah, right? They wouldn't or, even know. Yeah. Circumstance free. I'm quite sure that they would find a way around that. Like as much as they give you some sort of indemnity, I I don't. Uh, if they wanted to, they'd still pull the strings on it. it and then, like it would be like that as well. Yeah. And while we're on it, before we wander off of this one, when it comes to buybacks, I've also started thinking about the language behind that, and I'm starting to wonder if I want to just start calling them buyouts because mm -hmm. the back part, I honestly don't know where the back comes from, except for this idea that you only own at the behest of the government. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, that's the only real way to interpret the back part because the government's buying you out of a firearm or programs buying you out of a firearm. The back part must be that you have some sort of suborned authority. And I just don't, I don't like that. If you're an individual who's surrendering a firearm for money, then I would consider that a buy out, you know? Yeah, uh, completely. And buy back would indicate like, like you just said that, that they owned it at some point. That's Prior the, ownership. Uh, right. Yeah. Just false. All right. Uh, next story, Tim Allen not backing down on guns in his show. Deal with it. So this is the show Last Man Standing. I've actually never seen it. Have you guys? I've never seen it. Uh, uh, I've watched it. I've watched a number of episodes. Cool. Oh, Thias? Oh, I was going to say no, unfortunately. I, yeah. I haven't had cable in quite some time. Yeah, same. Uh, so apparently this show, pretty popular, uh, was canceled by one of the, AB it was canceled by ABC, brought back on Fox. Uh, Allen has a pretty conservative stance, apparently. And then the show owns a sporting goods store that has firearms and they're going to tackle that in the show. And I'm just a little bit curious as to where it's going to go. So that he's really excited that the show is back and uh, definitely that they're going to take that on. So uh, any prognostication? Uh, I'll start with you, Mark. So uh, Tim Allen had a very good quote in that article where he said that, you know, we're out on the baseball diamond. It's the bottom of the sixth. We're winning and I'm getting ready to go back up to bat. And then they just ABC just cancels the game right then and there. And it, that that analogy was uh, very fitting. He was up in the ratings. A lot of people were watching. Uh, a lot of people enjoyed it. It had a very good conservative spin to it. And then all of a sudden, you know, the the network decided to pull it. Everybody knows exactly why they decided to pull it, but um, they, they, you know, they sidestepped the question each and every single time. Now Fox is coming along and saying, Hey, you know, we're, we're going to revive it. We're going to bring it back. And uh, so, you know, Tim Allen's extremely excited and I'm, I'm, I'm actually excited to see how they continue to push that line, you know, and, and, and push that envelope a little bit more for a, positive conservative spin so we'll see i'm excited to see what happens 
Yeah, for sure. Kayla, thoughts on that? Um, I like I said, I, I do like Tim Allen. I like him as an actor, but I've never seen the show, so I can't really speak on it. And all I can say is celebrities tend to have a, a stronger stance than what they put out. So I want to see what type of stance he takes pro 2A in these episodes. And then, you know, I can be more educated to speak about it. But Yeah, uh, I'm very curious. Othias? Uh, again, I haven't seen the program. Uh, I My only concern is that I keep wondering why a show, I mean, we repeatedly now are seeing shows that have a definite political bias one way or the other. So when I hear that it's a more conservative show, I have to wonder, is it pro-conservative or is it just that it's more middle of the road and therefore not anti-conservative and therefore they're calling it conservative? So I, I would need to watch some episodes. I need to watch a significant number of episodes in order to be really versed on it. But I just, my natural hedge is, I'm really curious as to how actually conservative the show is because it feels like most of the stuff I watch or consume, I mean, I do a lot of podcasting as well, and it just, people are just working in political messages where there's no point. It's drama, it's science fiction, it's whatever, and the next thing I know, even if it's not in the show itself, it's it's a, a, a thing at the beginning or the end or what. it's just some token push in one di given direction, and I find it such a turnoff um, that you need to involve politics that have nothing to do with what you're on about at that moment. So if it's overtly conservative for no reason, maybe I won't like it. But if it's just sort of middle of the road, yeah, I'd probably like it a lot. Yeah, I'm kind of with you. Uh, my big concern is I, I don't know much about Tim Allen. Like I watched, uh, man, what was the show he was on? Man of the House. Home Improvement. Yeah. Home Improvement. Yeah, yeah. I haven't seen Man of the House, but I did watch Home Improvement. Thought that was funny. Loved it. I have no idea what his political leanings are. I have no idea what his grasp of the Second Amendment is. And the thing that makes me nervous is if he is pro gun, that's great. But if he doesn't have a great grasp of the second amendment, what it means, gun ownership in the United States and all these different things, and they go into the writer room and some of that stuff is kind of heavy handed and, and, you know, incorrect or wrong, or, you know, it does some of the fear mongering that the NRA marketing does. That's the kind of thing that really worries me. So hopefully they, they visit it and they don't spend a whole lot of time on it because honestly, I don't want to get my news from celebrities and made up talk, made up shows and things like that. Uh, I can enjoy stuff. I'm just very curious to see where they go with it. Uh, honestly, on that point, the bigger thing is, are they just going to have guns in the show or are they pushing a political gun message? Because, um, you know, sort of the acceptance of the homosexual movement comes from the fact that it was represented in media. You had character, like even if you didn't have a gay neighbor, you had a gay TV character that you understood with and identified in many ways. And that's been a big thing for growing understanding in that community. So I don't know that we need to shy away from the idea of having gun ownership represented as just commonplace in popular culture because, you know, there's many times I'm watching old Alfred Hitchcocks and things like that, and not every time a gun appears, even in a horror show, when a gun appears, it's not always this is a malicious intent because a lot of times it's just a thing that you own. They're all over the place. Yeah. And so it was part of American culture, and it's weird, but you're watching it. I've noticed a number of times. It's a show about a murder. A gun gets moved around or found or whatever and it doesn't even have to do with the murder it's just part of sort of the setting of everything that's going on and it's not considered to be obscene or a clue that someone is violent it's just it was background noise at that point in american culture and it's been taken away from the screen and therefore we think it's taboo and so it'd be interesting to see series that come out that just sort of have guns that don't talk about them either way they're just part of the experience it seems like that's what it's been historically we'll see if that continues because honestly a show just about normal American people that have guns, own guns, deal with guns, shoot guns, compete with guns, buy guns, and it's just completely normal, just like the, just like the real world is. Uh, yeah, I'd watch that show. Yeah, I, I never see characters get in and out of cars and then talk about uh, auto, you know, vehicular homicide or anything like that. Yeah. All right, uh, next story, uh, I think might have some autoplay here. Yep, autoplay video, my favorite thing in the universe. But uh, David Hogg was, got swatted. Uh, Hogg was out of town. He is the Parkland... He is a student at Parkland, uh, where, where the, the mass killing went on in Florida. And uh, someone called and said that there was a hostage situation going on at his house. So, of course, law enforcement dispatched a helicopter SWAT team, ERT team, whatever, whatever they call it there. <laughs> and they showed up. So I've seen a lot of reactions here. Initial reaction is, LOL, that's what he gets. But I, I have a little bit of a different reaction. I'd like to hear you guys' view. And uh, Kayla, I'm going to start with you. Um, 
Yeah, a lot of people, I mean, unless you're on the law enforcement side of things, you have no idea what goes into this type of scenario from, like you said, the helicopters, the, the SWAT people are on call. So they're probably not at work. So they have to come in from their ho- their homes and the whole area is basically put on lockdown. Nobody's in, nobody's out. And as this article said, somebody's somebody's been killed in a joke type of scenario. Um, and it's never a joke. Uh, people can get seriously hurt. Uh, waste time, money, resources. Uh, it's it's not a joke. Yeah, I agree, Mark. So uh, on my initial impression of it, I I, I was the same, LOL. But um, after careful consideration, and you know, just as you know, before mentioned here, there's a lot of um, effort, time, effort that goes into planning these types of situations, the execution of it. Uh, And then on top of that, it is diverting necessary resources away from actual crime that is occurring and, you know, could be thwarted uh, that way. So personally, I, I, it sends a bad message to, um, you know, individuals who are law abiding, gun loving individuals and it makes you know it kind of makes us look like assholes to be honest with you yeah could not agree more with us uh same camp realistically like there's there's ever so much if, in the broader picture of it there's a little bit of irony there and that you want to trust a state solution and then it's very easy to abuse the state solution which sort of i get what you're going for when you do this sort of quote-unquote performance art but uh, I think it's a waste of resources. I think it's crying wolf in a time when people are very alarmed. And I just think it's tacky. I mean, above and beyond anything else, if it weren't for the actual cost of it, even if it was a zero cost thing, it's a tacky way to debate politics. You have a problem with the man, you let him speak, you speak, and then people will decide. Yeah, could not agree more. Uh, next story, Valve Software removes active shooter game developer from their Steam platform. So we talked about this last week. Basically, uh, Steam is the platform, Valve is the company. And it's uh, kind of an open platform where game developers can submit games and those games can be available for sale. Uh, This one allowed you to play the role of a school shooter. Uh, We talked about it a lot last week. I think I was like, you know, let let the market decide. I don't think that this is going to make someone go out and be a school shooter. I think it's much much to do about nothing. Uh, But I'd like to get you guys' opinions. Uh, Mark, I'll start with you. So there's a level of tact in these types of situations where individuals should know that a you 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 have the ability to create these things but is it the right thing to do you know is 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 it being you know uh mindful of individuals that have been touched by gun violence such as this you know you know i've talked about it before my family's been touched by gun violence in a mass shooting so you know I see something like this and it kind of rubs me the wrong way, but they have every right to do that. Now, in this particular case, um, the, the, the developer was completely trolled by a creator uh, had been kicked off the platform before, uh, but was able to come back and do it again. So, you know, I think the, the platform needs to look at themselves a little bit closer to make sure that stuff like this doesn't happen again. But ultimately in, in a free society, free capitalist society, like you said, it should be out there. Uh, let the let the market decide. Yeah, Matthias, I'm a bad person because I I would just let it ride. Like yeah. I think you and I have had this conversation before, where it's I understand if it's like edgy or whatever, and a, a lot of teenagers are going to think it's cool and in your face, and then they'll hit 22 and they'll realize it's stupid. Like it, and it's you got to be able to go through that phase. I think the more you try to chase away that sort of like taboo stuff, the longer it stays with people. Like, I think you almost preserve it by uh, making it so, I don't know. I I think you elevate it. I think when they bother to ban it, they elevate it. Uh, I think the outrage fuels exactly what you don't want it to feel about that system. Yep. Agree. Uh, Kayla. Um, I think it definitely shocks the conscious of some people. I mean, especially with a sensitive time we are right now and i think just the simple name the active shooter game i mean it's but if you look at things like grand theft auto i mean you murder people and carjack people and assault people it's the same stuff and it's been around for decades i mean people are gonna play it video games don't make mass murders i mean it the, the concept of that is ridiculous i mean ba- i agree with what all of y'all said but i mean all I got. Yeah, no, I, I'm 100 percent with you. Uh, Grand Theft Auto. I'm like anyone who got mad about this game has obviously never played GTA <laughs> because I've done things in that game that I would be embarrassed if my grandma found out. Yes, right. but it wasn't. It wasn't in a school, and that wasn't a current news article. Oh, right. Yeah. 
it wasn't in the agenda at the time so <laughs> All right, good stuff, guys. Uh, former anti-gun writers now pro-gun realizes he was spewing propaganda from the no duh files. Uh, so this guy wrote for Salon Huffington Post, a uh, diehard Bernie supporter, and basically just realized that he was on the wrong side of uh, of history and changed his opinion. Now he's going to start a YouTube uh, review channel, and I don't know this. Uh, we don't need to spend a lot of time on this one. I just thought it was interesting. It, it's tough for people, I think, generally to admit when they were wrong and to say, Hey, I was wrong about this. I was wrong on this issue. Um, so do you guys think that it takes a big person to do this? Or do you think that he's got some other ulterior motives behind that? Uh, Othias, I'll start with you. I don't know that I can comment on his motive. I, I read the article and if I'm being honest, I don't think I could get under his reasoning for his change of heart. Like I, right. I read it and it felt like, it felt like a lot of platitudes. It felt very, it's odd but his pro gun argument felt about as shallow as the anti gun articles that I've read before. And it seemed okay. very like, I mean, it just, it was very bizarre. Like I just couldn't, I couldn't track where the flip happened and why it happened or where the conscience developers you're looking for a sort of a growth of character when you see a change like this. And I just couldn't find it in the story. Now, whether he wrote it poorly or it's not there, I don't know. Um, but here's the thing that, you know, self-reflecting on myself as I'm reading this and I'm being so sort of critical and I'm going, is this a trick or is this just shallow or attention? Or, you know, I start to look for all these malicious intent. Yes. And then the thing is I have to stop and look at myself and I go, uh, I think it was like Penn Gillette who said that like the hardest thing to do is to accept the apology. So, you know, it's hard enough to apologize or to change an opinion, but then to be the person on the receiving end of that, you have to stop and go, all right, I'm going to come on in. And so I want to sort of, regardless of where the intent was or how or why, my where I should be in my stance is, all right, welcome over. Like, I need to relax and just accept this person and not start being hypercritical of it. Uh, that's a really good point. Kayla? I mean, it's almost like the common sense light bulb just clicked on, I mean, out of nowhere. I mean, he all of a sudden, and it says in the article that he just realized that gun control only hurts law-abiding citizens and does nothing to deter crime or criminals, like, obviously. Like, yeah. but shooting a gun or reading an article, uh, that you don't draw that conclusion from that. I just, I, I'm along, I'm the same long lines with him. I just, I don't get the connection. I, I could not agree more. Mark? Um, same with Matthias here. One of the points that uh, he Matthias just made was, you know, he, he wasn't sure if it was uh, poorly written. If you've read, if you've read any of Salon or HuffPo, uh, you'd know it's probably poorly written uh, to begin with. But uh, if if you can't, if you can cannot connect the dots on where that flip happened and say this is the reason why I finally decided that. Uh, it is in my personal response, you know, my personal interest to be personally responsible for myself and my so, you know, self-preservation. Uh, if I could stumble through that anymore, um, then, <laughs> then, then that's kind of where I'm, eh, I'm a little iffy. So I'll, I'll keep my ear to the ground and see what happens. From the yeah, way. for sure. It just makes me laugh. It's like uh, witnessing a car accident and just deciding, you know what? I don't think I'm going to eat artichokes anymore. <laughs> It's just the whole thing's weird. All right, uh, moving out to some of the positive-ish news and uh, into some of the negative-ish news. California raises gun buying age to 21 and approves one gun per month. So this is passed through their Senate and now goes to the Assembly for further uh, finagling and, and whatever you want to call it. Uh, basically, propo proposal makes it a crime for a gun dealer to proceed with the sale of any firearm to an individual that the California DOJ has already processed an application for within the same 30-day period. Uh, just man, California, what's going on? Uh, Kayla thoughts, uh, other than, I mean, we all know California is like a communist state, um, at this point with regarding gun law, but I want to, I want to throw out an example because this example just makes it even more ridiculous. Um, like a lot of people are, you know, three gunners or either even cowboy action shooters, you mm -hmm. have three guns and then you usually have backups for all of those guns. Now you're telling me, say, you know, hypothetical after a match, very common, you go out, grab some food with, with your, with your squad, uh, while you're sitting there eating, somebody breaks into your car, steals your six guns. And so, so that law is telling me now that because I'm a victim of a crime, I have to wait six, eight months because I can only buy one gun per month to get back my own property because I was victimized. I mean, how backwards is that? How ridiculous is that? And then not to mention, I mean, when you're talking about 
all the profit, not from, from one, increasing the age by three years. So now all of those people have to wait three more years to buy a gun. And then also, and the, the fact that, uh, sorry, <sighs> you're rationing, you can only buy one every 30 days. The, the money that they're losing, meaning these, these gun stores here are going to go bankrupt. I mean, how are they going to stay up if these, because because Cal, California is the third leading state in gun sales. So how are they going to stay up? Which means you're going to have even more of a homeless problem because they're going to lose their business. They won't be able to feed their family. I mean, there's so many different ways you could go with this. It's just all, it's just asinine. Yeah. Uh, as all bills and laws that they get, <laughs> in, they have to do a fiscal analysis. They say they're going to lose out on $2.2 million per year. And, uh, and fees due to the cr decreased number of gun sales. And man, I, I just don't. Mark? So from my experience being, you know, prior service military, I am extremely frustrated with uh, legislation that comes across that says that a private citizen does not have the right to own a weapon until they're 21 years old. But we are perfectly fine sending a 17-year-old to the front lines to fight for our country. Now, the counter argument to that is, well, you know, they've got training. Well, coming from the military, uh, I, I, I beg to differ. <laughs> Some of these individuals in the military have literally shot themselves with all this high speed training that they get. So um, I, I'm, I'm really irritated that they, that people are okay burying their head in the sand saying that it's okay for a military person to, to, to go out and shoot fully automatic weapons, weapons of war, if you want to use the terms that they like to use. But yet, uh, you know, my son, who is 19, if he was in the state of California, he would not be able to uh, purchase a weapon of his own. He's okay to join the military. That's perfectly fine. But he, he can't own one his, uh, on his own on his own. And I can guarantee you, he has probably more training with a firearm at 19 than most 18 year olds in the military. So that's my biggest frustration with it. So annoying. Othias. I think, uh, it's weird, but this covers, these two moves cover a lot of ground. Um, one, we, you know, Kayla, we've already covered that, uh, this is going to starve out gun shops financially. It's also going to prevent panic buying, uh, which is actually a big portion of sales. And it's a big problem for people who want to move towards a gun ban is the saturation of guns in the U.S. market. So anything they can do to slow that down is going to be there to benefit. Um, <clears throat> the more than one a month thing, that is the part of this equation that is very hard to define from the other side in any sort of rational way. Because I go, I don't understand. Is there something about having multiple firearms that makes somebody more effective at killing? Because I can buy one firearm, limited capacity magazine in California, whatever, but I can get more mags. I can, I can unpin whatever California legal requirements is criminal. I can just, I can just do what I want. Having one firearm and a bunch of magazines legally or illegally, you're fine. Like you, you can do everything that you need to do with that. So I don't, I literally don't understand limiting the number of firearms. I don't know what they think they're preventing with that. Um, with the age requirement, that's a little weirder because as much as I want to say they're banning for 21 because a, it clears up some of these young shooters and B it clears up um, this period of curiosity where most people would be experiencing firearms for the first time and sort of keeping people away from that experience possibly. Uh, I don't think so. I think the 21 mark actually has almost nothing to do with guns. Um, I think that this 21 age has been a thing that's been pushed in America for a long time now. We see it with alcohol, but also in the college experience with trying to get people to live in the dorms for the entire period, to have a meal plan the entire period, to have public transportation the entire period. It feels like we are trying to push back uh, sort of the adult age from 18 to 21 across the board in this country. Like we just don't want 19 year olds being adults anymore. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if you see people starting to push back on military service before 21. Like it just, it's odd, but it just really feels like American culture is moving towards having children all the way up until the early twenties. Uh, I don't know why, but it's just, it's a hard push. Yeah. And then we see stories like the 30 year old who his parents had to take him to court to get him to move out of their house. Yeah. I mean, it's, on the on the you know there's a lot of small examples like that but i think if you take an average the average 17 year old in 1960 1970 had a lot more that they could get done on a proactive daily basis maybe less knowledge overall they're not as educated but being educated with no practical experience 
I think we sort of tip too far into the cerebral part of things and not enough into the mechanical daily life stuff. And it's just more of the same in this regard. Yeah, could not agree more. Uh, next story, 10th grade student commits suicide in an empty classroom in McKinney, Texas High School. So the school was put on lockdown. Kid walked into school, went to an empty classroom and uh, committed suicide. School was locked down. Reports of active shooter. This this is sad, but I thought the the interesting thing to talk about here was uh, just the people talking about there's no security that they can build a seventy million dollar football stadium that's all broken and, and wrecked and has cracks in it, but they can't put metal detectors in their schools. And I'd like to get thoughts on this one, starting with Mark. So the idea that we safeguard our banks more so than we are than than our school is disheartening. Um, you know, I, I grew up in Wichita. Um, the high school that I went to was probably one of the tougher high schools. Uh, I wouldn't say the toughest, but one of the tougher. Uh, we had a lot of gang activities. We had a lot of gang fights. And, um, you know, anybody could walk in. I knew several people that would walk in with trench, coat, trench coats and uh, shotguns underneath of them. Um, now, naturally, you uh, <laughs> snitches get stitches, so you keep your mouth shut real quick. But uh, the, the the idea that uh, we're going to create a prison-like environment is the counter argument to putting metal detectors in schools and more guards and so on and so forth, I think is absolutely idiotic. The, you, you could look at any bank in, in the United States, even the smallest podunk bank that you could find still has a security guard and metal detector. So yeah, that that's the part that I'm completely disheartened by. Um, I'm also disheartened by uh, the, the fact that the, there was a suicide. Um, we see that individuals uh, of this age who are committing these acts of school shootings or suicides have been bullied or picked on, pushed around, whatever the case may be. And it, it, high school's tough these days, especially especially now. And I think I think we need seriously need to look at that and see what we can do to improve our kids' lives just to be happy, you know? Yeah. Kayla, thoughts? Um, I'm along the same lines as him. Uh, I mean, obviously a suicide is, is tragic. And like he said, we need to figure out what we can do to improve the mental state of youth nowadays. But, and he, I like how he said it. We're trying to turn high schools into a prison like environment. There's guns in prison. If you cannot keep guns out of prison, you cannot keep guns out of schools. It doesn't matter. And you can look at courthouses. There's metal detectors there. So if you put metal detectors in schools, they're probably going to be the same type of officers or deputies that are old, close to retirement, overweight. They're not really paying attention. One, I mean, I metal detect all the time for our courtroom. Metal detectors fail. Technology fails. So they're not going to stop guns from getting in there. And this article seems like it's trying to make the suicide of the child a gun issue. It's not a gun issue. Suicide is never a gun issue. So that's what I got. Matthias? Uh, again, I, I agree. It's split in half, but uh, to the suicide point, it's a personal story for a person. Unless I see the national average climbing for some reason, I don't know how I'm supposed to address a singular suicide. Um, it's yeah. hard to know what was going on with this kid. Although if you're seeing two problems in the same school environment, I suggest that if you want to treat a problem like this, like uh, mental instability in youth, um, you know, the other trend we've had going on is bigger, more centralized high schools much more top down, more students per teacher, less personal voice, less what, and then, you know, they've also targeted bullying in such a degree that you can't physically pick on anybody, but that's okay. Cause you can translate all of that into actually just gutting a person emotionally over and over and over again. And you can't stop that. So I don't know if it was better when people used to take a swing at each other and not get into this game of actually really breaking down, especially young males, like self-esteem beyond just taking a punch. Like taking a punch makes you feel bad. Don't get me wrong. I don't think it does nearly as much emotional damage as just being sat down on day in, day out and made to feel like you don't belong over and over and over again, because it's the only way you can express this sort of teenage angst at each other. Um, I don't know. There could be any number of like psychological cultural effects and nobody talks about, should we explore 
having smaller schools that are more tailored to different kids' needs and different kids' development levels? Are we looking at this? Are we looking at that? No, they go, can we crack down on this harder? Can we go for more security theater? Can we teach kids that they need to be afraid every day? Can we get 99% of them to be even more obedient than they ever were before and learn to just be sheep for the rest of their life? And then the 1% that are actually horrible, maybe, maybe, maybe we could catch them if they aren't clever enough and just punish them into the dirt instead of reforming them. And so I don't like security. I don't like the prison like schools. They already look like prisons to me anyway. I mean, I went to high school on an open campus designed in like the thirties and there was a million points of ingress and egress. And there was a lot of like smaller classrooms and teachers knew you and you had engagement and I wasn't the happiest teenager and I still was fine. Like I never thought to actually hurt anybody. So yeah. I don't know. I, I, I think it needs more study than just this sort of moral outrage and then trying to, from the top down, force a behavior onto a group of people without understanding the motivation. That guy's good stuff. Next story, a little bit more positive. FBI agent negligently shoots man after his gun fell out of his holster while dancing. We set this up for you. So he's at a club here, Denver, Colorado. He's working it. He's working it. He's dancing. I'm feeling it. I'm watching this video. I'm like, man, this guy. Yeah, he, he he's going home with somebody. Uh, that's all I'm going to say. And then he's like backflip. And I'm like, damn, he did a backflip. And then I see something fall out of his pants. And then I see him start to panic and I see him reach for it. And then at the very last second, you realize it's a gun. As he reaches for it, it, uh, it goes off. It shoots a guy in the leg. He picks it up quickly, puts it back in his pants uh, where he was carrying it at, you know, six o'clock. And uh, apparently a guy got shot. And then he puts his hands up like, uh, I'm not an active shooter is what it seemed like to me. And Holy, I, I don't even know where to start with this one. Uh, so I'll start with Mark. So goes back to my uh, comment a little bit ago about training, right? So you have a government agency that's supposed to have some of the most trained individuals and, and you have something like this happen. Uh, I would also say that if he was, if he had been carrying a 1911, this wouldn't have happened. I'm just, just throwing that out there. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh I kid, but uh, no, it, it's all about training. It's, you know, you, 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 you flub up, you need to know how to, how to remedy that situation immediately and safely. And uh, the part that I was most upset about was that he just, just walked away. Like nothing happened. Hands up, don't shoot, you know? <laughs> and uh, he just walked away like nothing happened. And someone ended up being injured because of it. So um, I, I hate to say it, in this situation, dude was acting a fool, playing stupid games. He gets stupid prizes. I hope, I uh, hope he's no longer on the, on, on the force anymore after this. So Kayla. Uh, well, I'm, I'm really curious. Uh um, there may be alcohol involved in this. Um, and if that's the case, it's, it might not be a lack of training. It's just pure negligence um, on his behalf. And I think when you carry, you have to carry yourself in a certain way. He, sh he shouldn't, I mean, yeah, he can do his dance moves and he can move, but doing a backflip and you got a gun and the gun didn't go off when it fell. It went off when he picked it up. So that's, I, I would like to think that, I mean, you're not that stupid. I mean, we know when you're trained, I mean, and I've worked with the FBI before, so I know they are not the brightest in the box. A lot of, at least the ones I've worked with, I'm just saying. Uh, but, I, you know, I'm curious to know if, if there was alcohol involved. Yeah, I am curious as well. I mean, like, I, I try to look at these things like from a human perspective and like, yeah, we all know don't rush to grab a gun that's been dropped or anything. In fact, like, don't try to grab it at all. Like, we, we know that. But you think about this, you know, this is a guy at a club dancing, does a backflip, sees his gun. I'm sure he was just absolutely mortified. He's like, oh, my God, goes to grab it really quick, grabs it too quick, shoots a person. And then, you know, him kind of just walking away, like hands up, like, hey, uh, in my guess was just like, hey, I'm not an active shooter. Please conceal carriers. Don't shoot me. Um, and God, it's just like this is that kind of human thing where things like it just affected the whole future of his life very likely just for one one second of just sheer stupidity like we don't know this guy he maybe he's got a history of problems going going all the back to all the way back to quantico but i don't know just to me it just seemed like a really human moment and I, i'm having a tough time just like condemning him for the rest of his life for it like it, I, it is i a think human. i think we actually might have a cultural problem at this point uh the four rules have caught on they're very good 
um, and gun safety is through the roof. Like gun accidents are lower than they've ever been by a wide, wide margin because the culture has really adopted a uh, booger hook bang switch mentality. Mm -hmm. The problem is the fifth rule, the unspoken rule, and it's often unspoken, is never snatch. Like you can say never grab a gun as it's dropping, but then there's also what this guy is, it hit the ground. It shouldn't have been on the floor, so he panics mm -hmm. and tries to snatch it back up. So when he grabs for it, he grabs whole hand, every finger, and discharges the gun, which is the same as trying to catch it in midair. Yeah. It's this idea of never snatch a firearm. You should handle firearms deliberately and with a sense of calm because unwanted motor motion is just going to that's it. That's that's the problem. Nothing bad would have happened if his gun had fallen out on the floor and just sat there for a count of 10. Nothing was happening. But he perceived an emergency, the fall, or in this case, laying out in public, and he snatched the gun. And when you're in a hurry, that's where the accidents happen. And so I recommend that somebody release a product. It's just like the blue gun, but it's got an active trigger. You slather it in grease and ship it to people, and they use it in their training drills. And if they ever accidentally pull the trigger, it sets off a big red light and a screeching, horrible noise. And you just train with that every week, and then you'll learn never to snatch your gun. Because, I mean, I'm joking, but at the same time, how much training do you have to not snatch a gun? I mean, how many situations do you come across where you've lost control of a weapon? Because you avoid losing control of your weapon no matter what. But then on the rarest occasion that it happens, you have no practice at what to do with when you've lost control of it. Yeah, and it's tough. I've dropped a gun during a match. It was, it. I I did not reach for it. I did not try to grab it. But it took everything in me not to do that. And it's just because I have practiced it. So I, I was definitely thinking about it. I think we can all agree that we're lucky that this wasn't a Sig P320 because more people could have been injured. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> all right. Uh, going back into some serious stuff. Paroli that beat a cop into unconsciousness, sentenced to time served. So we've got it. Obviously, a parolee beats a cop until he's unconscious and then um, basically does some time served and that's what he gets. That's it for, for going after one of our you know law enforcement officers. That's what he gets. Time served plus eight days. And uh, Kayla, I'm going to I want to start with you. Uh, thoughts on this? Um, I've got a couple of different angles. This is something that I am very passionate about, uh, one of these angles. For one, he was an off-duty cop, so he was probably not in uniform. He was trying to intervene into an, a probably a very heated altercation. Uh, punches were being fly, flying. So there, nobody, nobody can know at that time that he was actually assaulted. If anybody knew, I don't think it would have mattered one way or another. But my, my issue bigger issue here is this guy shows a pattern of violent behavior. He's already on patrol for, or on patrol, on parole for carjacking. Um, and I, I, this, this might be a harsh statement, but I think there's blood on the hands of judges with a lot of these sentencing because people that are sentenced to violent crimes like this need to stay in jail. He, he didn't even do half of his sentence before he was let out. And then he commits another felony. Uh, people have died because of these things. They don't, they don't serve the time that they deserve, and they're wreaking more havoc on their cities and the officers and everybody around them when this happens. Yeah, it's really tough. Mark? My one question to everybody, and it's a rhetorical question, where did it happen? Uh, yeah, uh, mm -hmm. Illinois. Yeah, it's Chicago, <laughs> right? It's Chicago. They call it Chirac for a reason, and I think that uh, there is a legitimate problem in Chicago when it comes to the, the, you know, the, I don't know, what do you want to say? The, the left leading government culture in that, in that part of, I, I just, I don't know. I just don't know. You, you have a serious, serious problem in Chicago. And until they start laying the hammer down and forcing, um, and I don't want to say mandatory minimums or anything like that, but start putting as Kayla was saying, violent criminals away for a long time and forcing them to um, live, you know, live out their sentence, hopefully to reform them, then this is just going to continue on. So Matthias, uh, first of all, you can kick the cop part out. That's just for sensationalism. Again, Kayla's Agreed. right. I didn't know that it was. A was fire. Thinking, so my yeah. biggest thing is we, we get upset about these, sh you know, I, I get shooting statistics thrown at me all the time, murder statistics, all this other stuff, violence in America. And the problem is the only real indicator for future violence is past violence. So I get really offended when they go extra lenient on violent activity. I, I don't know about you guys, but I'm, I'm completely done with the drug war. 
I don't care about recreational use of whatever. I mean, if you're drugging other people, yeah, that's a big problem. That's a violation of their autonomy. But like you consuming drugs does not bother me in the slightest. That's your lack of responsibility and upbringing and whatever else. Um, if you are put away for how many years for how many ounces of, I mean, even cocaine. But this man takes a swing. And the other thing that offends me too, and it has nothing to do with this, but is when people brandish firearms in the commission of a crime and are not severely punished. Like that is a threat on somebody's life. It's attempted manslaughter the minute you brandish that firearm. I'm sorry. And so I don't like that we take these sort of people who we know for a fact are violent, who we know are going to hurt someone else. We know. Does anybody doubt that this person is going to go out there and hurt somebody else? Does anybody in this room have any doubt to it just from the basics? Of the no, story? not not even a little. No, maybe Sean, I did want to I did want to add to this because this is almost on a daily basis. I'm obviously I'm in the law enforcement field and I get all of our reports from the jail, the release reports. Almost like I said, a daily basis. There's drug traffickers, aggravated assaults. These people are getting out on OR bonds, which is a signature bond. They, they're just getting released. They just get to walk out of jail for trafficking drugs, for aggravated assault, for these violent crimes, and they just get to walk out of jail. Oh, I'll come back to court. That's fine. Yeah, yeah. I'll do that. And it's ridiculous. Something yeah. has to stop it. Instead of prosecuting the drug side of things, they need to take that money and that time, and they need to turn it towards the, the people that can't be reformed, getting them anger management, and hell, prescribe them government marijuana if that's what it takes. I don't care. But like, we need to dial down the aggressors that can be dialed down and we need to hold the ones that can't be. Yeah. Yeah. I, I could not agree more. Good stuff. Um, next story, guys, murder of Tennessee deputy Spurs manhunt for sus, uh, for suspect murder of deputy captured. This happened in Tennessee. And again, you know, we've got violence against officers being a theme in the show lately. Uh, not the last story necessarily, but this is this one definitely for sure. Without question. Uh, Big manhunt going on, basically just murdered a cop and and you know went on the run. And my fear is is that you know he he's gonna maybe do a little bit of time, but not as long as he should. Taylor, I'll start with you. Um, this is one of the few things uh, violence against law enforcement that actually brings out emotion in me. I've been to several police officers' funerals, and there is not a dry eye in the in the in the room. Um, but it's it's something that you have to learn from. Um, and I, I read, I, anytime this happens, I dive into it as much as I can. Um, and it's and you're not bad-mouthing the officer. You're not bad-mouthing the deputy. It's a training. To, you have to learn what went wrong and what can prevent it in the future. And, um, well, one thing I will say is it looked like this, this guy, after he killed him, drove the car two to three miles to even hide it. That, I mean, that's... You, when you hear about these type of stories, they shoot as they're running away. They happen to hit the guy and they take off. They don't try to premeditate at this and try to give them more time to hide. But to me, it sounds like what happened was in this scenario because the female, there was a female involved too. And they were both in the back of his patrol car. So he allowed them in the back of his patrol car with what I'm assuming he had a weapon on him. So whether or not they were in handcuffs, whether or not they were in custody at the time, I don't know. Uh, but it's a training. It's a training. Uh, it looks to be a training issue here. Um, how he was in the back of this car with a, with a weapon on him uh, is something you always have to be mindful about. You've got to search these people uh, because you can hide weapons in all kinds of crazy places. Yeah, the prison purse is a popular so. place. Mark, thoughts? You know, I, I don't, I didn't get a chance to read this article. Um, the, I, I'm just bothered by the fact that, um, you know, our law enforcement really doesn't get the credit that they deserve. You know, um, being in the military, um, being a military spouse, uh, you know, I constantly, um, get told, you know, thank you for your service and stuff like that. And, and I kind of go out of my way to do that to law enforcement. Yeah. I'm used to seeing individuals in uniform for the military all around me. Cause I live near a military installation, but, um, I, I make it an effort to do that for the law enforcement because I don't, I don't think that they, uh, hear it enough. And I don't think that the, they, um, get the respect that they deserve because of, you know, the sensationalism, sensationalism of police brutality, you know? Um, so I, I'm just, I, I just, you know, just want to send my well wishes to the family. I hope that they're able to, to, you know, 
get through this tragedy and 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 um i hope that the individual that commit this crime i i, I hope that um i hope he has a real rough time in jail you know um because these people are putting their lives on the line each and every single day i mean they could they could die a hundred different ways each and every single day and and they no one bats an eye at it they're just like well eh, eh. Yeah, that sucks for them. You yeah, know, he looked, he looked a little beat up and uh, under the weather, and they said that his injuries are consistent with someone who had hit out in the woods for a couple of days. And I'm like, oh, well, like falling off of a cliff. But hey, I support it totally. In. Oh, Thais. I mean, I read through the article, and there's just not enough details. I feel like I'm a straw man in anything I say. Yeah. Um, but I do agree. Like, I think the people, the thing that people really don't understand is a lot of people now in our culture have nine to fives of some sort or a job that's very structured. And they understand what they're getting into every day and how they're going to get home and what they're doing. for. Them. And I think being involved with police, it's they have a day that is made out of various emergencies or uh, I mean, it's always something that has gone wrong for somebody else that brings the police out. You never know what you're going to get. You never know when exactly you're getting home necessarily or if you're getting home in this case. And so I think people need to be a bit more sympathetic for the fact that you have people that, yes, might get into it for the wrong reasons, but the broad, broad majority are people who are actively trying to engage their community, make their community better, and are taking responsibility not just for themselves, but for the world around them. Yeah. All right. Uh, I'm going to skip ahead a couple stories move into the I'm offended segment. And the story that I want to talk about first is anti-gun group compares firearms industry to Joe Camel. Uh, they put out a report said, start them young and documents exactly how the gun industry is working to appeal to kids. Um, just, just what utter garbage. Like, okay, first of all, selling cigarettes and guns, there's no, there's nothing there. There's no similarities there whatsoever. Second amendment is, you know, our, our naturally given right. So, Cigarettes is, has nothing to do with that. It's kind of like the the driver's license and, and gun license kind of argument. Uh, I just I find it ridiculous. And yeah, I, I don't think there's a problem marketing. No, I think uh, the the gun industry is definitely not based on the cigarette industry. It's based on the gambling and alcohol industry. Yes. Yeah, they put out a bunch of high gloss photos, and they hope that a handful of people will like. They want everybody to buy a gun, but they know that some of us are friggin' addicts, and we're going to buy thirty, and that's going to keep them in business. And you know what? That's fair. That's every industry. Yeah. <laughs> like. That's vinyl figures. Nobody like there's not somebody that buys one vinyl figure. You either have 30 of the dang things or you have none. And so, okay, fine. They can market to us by the fact that they know some of us are suckers that'll end up with all this crap on their walls. Yep. That's fair. But uh, we're all adults. And I've just I've seen I've seen marketing towards youth in terms of sport, but it's actually interesting. I've never seen I've never seen a single gun seller market a controversial rifle to youth. I've seen them market youth rifles. As a matter of fact, the stuff that's directed towards kids is almost exclusively the most boring stuff because they want them to take their time and be safe because they care about having these people live long enough to buy their products. Yeah. So they say, this is a direct quote from the article, just as our society does not condone the use of alcohol or tobacco by minors, even with adult supervision, we should prohibit the acquisition, possession, and use of firearms by children. Like, Absolutely. And you should never have any sort of sex education until you're 18. And you should never really be allowed to drive a car until you're 21. And you should never. And we'll see how this all stacks up. It'll be great. I'd like to see a six-year-old go into a, a gun store and buy a gun. I think that would be interesting. Uh, Kayla, thoughts on this one? I, I think it's a little absurd that they're, that they're trying to say that like color variation means you're targeting like a five-year-old little girl. I mean, I have an orange rifle, I have a shield with a purple trigger, and I have a hot pink concealed carry holster. I have all of those. I have no children in my home. That doesn't mean you're targeting children. And the same thing goes with plastic accessories for your rifle. Have you heard of like uh, shooting sports? Or have you heard of like, you have to take a long shot and you don't want a heavy rifle? And it's the same thing with technology. I mean, as technology advances, cars get lighter for, you know, lower gas mileage. I mean, the, the technology improves and so does the end product. I mean, it's not targeting children in any any way, shape or form. And again, it's not relevant to tobacco. I don't know why that's it, even in the article. Yeah, I reject their premise that these are adult products. Like, I think that firearms education should be taught from a very young age. Uh, it doesn't mean they have to they have to go shooting, but they should definitely know what guns are, what to do if you see one. Uh, basically, everything that Eddie Eagle teaches. Mark, thoughts? Uh, well, I, I'm curious to see what uh, the the definition of a youth is. Is if, if is it is it 18 and under? 
um, you know, I'd under, like to understand better their definition of that because, you know, today today's D Day, right? We 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 take a moment to to think about what our grandfathers or fathers did, uh, or in some cases, some of our audience may even be actual individuals that stormed the beaches of Normandy, and and. and it's perfectly fine for the the kid who was 16 years old that lied his way into fighting war uh, to storm a beach with a with a with a gun. But we can't we can't start a conversation about teaching kids how to safely operate a, a weapon. I've never just like Athias says, I've never seen a ad for a gun targeted for kids outside of a cricket 22 long rifle, you know, Um or maybe a maybe like a Walter P twenty two maybe I I don't know like a twenty two pistol or something like that so I just it's just the premise is completely unrelated and I think it's retarded and I'm over here just- actually on his point it's almost a little insidious because you're implying that there's no reason to use a firearm unless you're an adult treating it as a weapon like yeah what, it, it's interesting because you teach 15, 16 year olds how to drive cars. Uh, that's extremely dangerous. I mean, that's that's very dangerous. I, Sixteen-year-olds in cars is frightening, quite honestly, more so than them with firearms. There's a lot more controls, and it's you know with the firearm, you you while you're pointing and aiming and it's loaded, that lasts however many minutes to an hour, and then you're done and it's out. But the car, all the way around, everywhere you go, a million different permutations. Like imagine the most advanced range with all the flippy targets and everything you want. That's an average Saturday drive for a teenager, you know. So. I don't understand what's the comparison here. Like the gun is a utility. Yes, it can be used as self-defense weapon. Uh, it can also be used for sport and hunting and uh, all sorts of things, all sorts of values there. Uh, but no, we're going to imply that it's an adult only thing just right from the go. Yeah. And, and I'm over here just thinking like, how many times do I see Elmer Fudd shoot Bugs Bunny in the face? with Yes. A shotgun? And uh, I turned out okay-ish. Well, I want to point out, I played Pokemon and I can't stop dog fighting now. <laughs> <laughs> yes, got to collect them all. All right. Uh, next up, we're going to move, I think, right into the full auto news segment stories. The real media won't talk about another crazy stuff, which is where we kind of all pick our own story. Mark, you could pick one while we go through these. Uh, Kayla, I'm going to start with you. What's your story? Um, I picked the one from uh, Texas where the guy was shot twice, but he continued to chase down his attackers. Um, I actually looked more into the story. I wanted to see if there were any updates. Basically, the gist of it is it's 530 in the morning. He's walking to his car and he is approached by two armed men. Uh, He resists. They're trying to rob him. He resists. Um, He gets shot uh, in the arm and in the chest. Um, They get away. He chases them in the vehicle, uh, but in but never catches them and ends up being treated at the hospital. Uh, he is in stable condition now, but uh, my whole, my whole issue is this, and I want to kind of raise a question. First off, you can always talk about concealed carry, but honestly, how many, I mean, when you're approached by two armed men with, with drawn guns, you're, you're kind of at a loss already. Uh, yeah. Drawing on, you, you can't, you can't beat unless you're like some tactical ninja, like you can't beat and get away unharmed if someone is drawn on you, has their finger on the trigger. You're so it, it's, it raises the question, is that a fight you really want to take? I mean, and it's a personal decision. I can't, I'm not going to say one way or the other, but uh, you've got to weigh the risks. But I also want to talk about situational awareness. Um, was he on his phone? Was he, were these men hiding or were they waiting out? Could he have seen them in advance to get away from the situation to where this never would have happened? I don't know. It doesn't say uh, but it's just something to think about. Yeah, I totally agree. You can't draw on a drawn gun. That's like one of the basic <laughs> right. uh, self-defense. Uh, the, pretty crazy. crazy. He, you know, we always talk about what that warrior mindset, that never quit attitude. He had like the Viking mindset. He was like a berserker. <laughs> All right. Anything else on that one, guys? No, I think she covered it well. Oh, thanks. Yeah, very well. What's your story? Mine's similar, although more confusing. I took this one because it opens a couple of questions. It was a uh, Memphis man, and apparently a f- it's it's worded so poorly that it's kind of confusing. But uh, he was coming home and arrived to see this front door was uh, pried open. There were uh, at least two people inside, and they had a weapon. It says that one of them had two pistols. That's interesting. So I think the guy was... Du- if this is worded correctly, the guy's dual wielding. That's interesting. Um 
And then started, this is odd. The suspects allegedly began shooting when the man's friend ran outside. And so far, the man has been the homeowner. So I guess maybe he had a friend that is so poorly worded. But they did not press charges on the individual for defending his home. Um, so here's the interesting thing. You come home, your, ho your door's kicked in, and um, you, start, you see inside somebody's still in there. Do you have a duty to retreat is the big question. So in this case, if they did immediately see this person and open fire on him, well, yeah, of course he can defend himself. But this actually gets pretty interesting because you have no need to re-enter your home. And this is one that doesn't really come up very often. It's like, yes, if somebody invades your home and you are in your home, I don't think you have a duty to retreat because why should you have to clear your own domicile at that moment? But at that, at that time that you're not in your own house, I think you can avoid an engagement just backing off and calling the police, especially in the time of cell phones. So... Um, it's interesting they got cleared, so I imagine it's just because they actually opened fire on someone who wasn't in the house. Yeah, here in Colorado, this would be illegal. You're not allowed to enter your house unless there's a family member or or another human being that could be in danger of death or serious bodily harm. Um, so yeah, uh, kind of interesting. Uh, thoughts on this one? Anyone else? Well, I, I know in the state of Kansas, we have you know the quote unquote. Can, uh, castle doctrine, you know, that uh, you are able to uh, defend your home. Uh, in this particular situation, I'm not sure if you uh, could, in fact, enter your home and then <laughs> then enter, and then kill someone. But uh, uh, you know, I, I'm I'm of the mindset unless my unless a family member is, um, and that includes my dogs, uh, is in the house and could be at harm, then, uh, yeah, I'm going in and, and, and defended my, my family. So, um, yeah. I, I can't wait in, in where I live. I can't wait the seven minutes for, uh, a police officer to arrive. So. Yeah. In Colorado. So in Colorado, we don't have the requirement of preclusion, which, you know, we've got basically castle doctrine, but we would not be able to enter that house because we would be putting ourselves into that situation where, where there didn't need to be a situation and interesting fact, dogs and animals do not count under that. So we could not go in to rescue our dogs. And if we did go in, shoot somebody while trying to rescue our dogs, uh, we'd probably be, uh, spending a lot of time in court. I mean, unless they were also armed and presenting apparently. And that's a, all these issues that these sort of odd stacks come down to where we as a society want to draw the social contract. I mean, it's just like, what is the appropriate punishment for coming off the cut? Because every crime against another human being is a breach of a social contract that we're all sharing. Like we all agree to stop at red lights. We all agree not to steal from each other because all around this is just not going to be a good way to live if we keep sort of acting Machiavellian. So the problem is at what point do you forfeit your life in the social contract, your protection of your life? Like at what point do you become sort of subhuman in the social contract? And we can all say death and a lot of us can agree maybe rape, but when it comes to theft, some people say no. I mean, most people, I would say, for theft, say no. But there are some people that say in the Constitution, you know, it was supposed to be life, liberty, and the pursuit of property, and then they changed it to happiness. But there's still a, a very strong sense in America of property also being something that's, like, uh, set for you. And this also comes from a mindset before insurance. I think with insurance and everything else, maybe it's not that big of a deal. But there's still people out there that would argue that I get to defend my property even down to somebody else's life. I don't know that I come in on that line, but that's probably where the disagreements happen. Yeah. All right. So my story is. Sorry, getting over a cold. My story is Google this Florida woman shot her husband in the back of the head because she didn't like his tone of voice when he asked her to search for something. So straight up legit. Uh, he asked her to search for a project template on Google. She became upset with his tone of voice. She says that he rem she remembers him walking out of the room and then her memory became a blur, in quotes, and she shot him in the head. And I'm like, well, if I ever get to a point where my tone of voice could get me shot, then I don't have much hope for the future. But does anyone like feel like this is like could be every every relationship ever? <laughs> so. Right. I, I can tell you that on several occasions I have been called a battered husband. So <laughs> yeah, I don't, uh, I only, I only spend my time with very, uh, strong female personalities. My, my mother ruled our house, so I, I don't have time for uh, sort of passive, uh, women. I, I know when to behave. 
But <laughs> realistically, I think this is the thing that a lot of people want to point to that they feel deep inside themselves is this impulsivity to like to sort of use a gun. And a lot of people say that they're they would never trust themselves with a gun. Well, good. I don't trust you with one either, if that's your perspective, because apparently this is one of those people who is incapable of restraining themselves for a moment. And it's a real thing. I mean, there's there's some psychology behind it. I'm not a psychologist, but uh, this is just extremely poor impulse control. But yeah. um, you see this with a number of disorders. I mean, there are people out there who are just undiagnosed with a number of, I mean, you can be from trauma or brain damage or any other things where like impulse control is just, almost nothing and i think it comes out in a lot of ways i think i think being a woman uh with the expectations in society and the fact that you can get away with being sort of more violent and impulsive without necessarily having them come down on you i think you can make it for a good number of years and then finally be in a position where your impulse control goes way off the charts yeah it's but then again this goes back to the early thing if you have previous violent tendencies i would like to see you locked the crap up until it's taken care of diagnosed one way or another uh my guess is this that this didn't really surprise a lot of the people who knew the couple. I have no basis for saying that, but my guess would be that there's been some interesting behavior because man, just kind of crazy. Mark, were you able to find a story that you liked? Yeah. Um, I looked at this a little bit earlier today and it, it touches on a couple of different things that, okay, it's in the UK, but I think it could apply to everyday life in the United States, especially in larger cities. And it is terrifying moment as cyclist armed with a huge zombie knife, which I've, I'm not sure you guys know what a zombie knife is. I've never seen one. It probably had a green handle. Yeah, uh, I think it's just a knife painted green. I yeah. see. I see. Uh, anyway, uh, tries to smash motorist window after rush hour road rage. Uh, row breaks out in front of stunned London commuters. And basically what happened was a uh, car was parked along the curb. A cyclist is rolling up alongside of it. Um, the vehicle tries to pull out and narrowly misses the cyclist. Cyclist gets upset, runs up to the car that ends up getting wedged into two, in between two other cars kicks the car, pulls out this huge 10 inch blade and just starts whacking at the windshield with this blade. Um, now, uh, a couple different things. Number one, road rage. That's something that we all deal with on a daily basis. You know, someone cuts you off, you get irritated and so on and so forth. Um, obviously London's having a crime wave with knives. They've had 43 or 48 uh, knife deaths this year so far. So the London, London mayor has uh, started a war against knives. Um, but the other thing too, is if you watch the full video that, you know, they're, they're, they start off saying that the cyclist is a victim, that he's almost hit by this, by this, uh, vehicle. But then, um, the, the, you know, the, the guy in the vehicle is just distraught. He tries to get away as quickly as possible after he almost hits the cyclist and you watch the full video, you'll see the cyclist pull up next to the car and then stop right next to the car. And then the vehicle pulls out in, in a hurry. Uh, so I, I think that there was something that happened before then they don't elaborate on that. They start to make the cyclist look like the victim. Then the driver turns into the victim. So at, at the very least, a couple different things, come out of this is number one you know if you get into a situation where you are in a road rage situation even if you're in the right it's always best just to diffuse the situation and say hey man i'm sorry or you know put your hands up in the car and say sorry my fault dude you know whatever just diffuse the situation to help protect yourself even if you're in the right and then the next thing is you, you just gotta you gotta figure out a way to get out of that situation as quickly as possible um and yeah, it, it, it's just a horrible, horrible thing. Uh, what gravitated me to this article was the whole idea of a zombie knife. Yeah. So. <laughs> it's like, well, this was, have you ever had those dreams where like something's happening and it, there's a murderer killing everybody and you have to draw your gun, but you either can't draw your gun or you can't pull the trigger or the gun doesn't work or something like that. Just those, those uh, defensive impotence type dreams. Watching this video is like watching one of those dreams. Cause I'm like, just drive away, drive away, drive away, drive away. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I don't know that that was tough to watch. And that guy goes from the bicycle rider goes from like zero to insane maniac in like 0 0.3 seconds. Yeah. And again, if you, if you get a chance to watch that video, the full length video, you, it, you watch it right before the car pulls out, rewind it a couple times and watch it. And you'll see that cyclist. He's, 
rolling along and then he stops right next to that car and looks at the car as if something had happened previously so yeah. man they should ban guns though right they should and knives yeah I, I believe i believe on saturday uh, they wore orange for every town against knife violence yeah, i wear orange a few times a year when i go hunting <laughs> we're selling orange shirts now so I, I i like to wear orange i think it's a good color all right, guys, that'll wrap it up for our stories tonight. I'd like to give you guys a second to talk about what you're up to, what you're doing, where people can find you. Uh, Othias, I'm going to start with you. Uh, you guys know where I'm at, cnrsonal.com or cnrsonal over at YouTube, or just look for World War One Primer if you can't spell any of that. Or just pick your favorite World War One firearm and search it because it'll probably turn up. We're over halfway through the series now. Um, and it's just more of the same. I don't know if you can see behind me, but I've just basically started stockpiling machine guns to get through the second half of the series, so... Um, as much as I can get these things running, I think we'll get out and start filming. That's fantastic. What the heck is that one behind you? Uh, there's an MG08, a Lewis gun, a Hotchkiss 1914, and I'm also re-wadding an MP18 that somebody happily registered, even though it had been leaded. So we just got to replace the barrel and redo the bolt face. Man, I'm so happy that you exist. <laughs> it's taking a lot of work. <laughs> I love it. And I'm glad you're the guy to do it. Kayla, where can people find you? Um, I'm on Facebook and Instagram. Uh, my pages are tacked to Kayla. Uh, and I just post a lot of my competition videos, a lot of just to show the love, my love for firearms and different, different companies all on there. So you can check it out if you're interested. Very cool. That's awesome. Keep up the great work. Thanks. Mark, how about you? Well, uh, you can find me on the YouTubes, uh, Fit and Fire, or Instagram, Fit and Fire 78. I have my newly constructed website, fitandfire.com. Um, some of the things that I've got going on right now, I'm just all over the place. I've got some long range shooting that I'm trying to get into. I've got some suppressor stuff, uh, some customization on my, uh, my new Glock 19. So I'm just all over the place. A lot of great things to come. So. How much would the California one gun per month affect what you hope to be doing as a career some, at some point? Um, I, I would move from California. <laughs> I, I, I seriously would. Uh, as a lot of people say, uh, I would not comply. Yeah. yeah. I know, Thias, I mean, all those guns that you've got there, I assume uh, most of them uh, are considered firearms. I, I'm in South Carolina. Yeah. The, yeah. We don't care. <laughs> Come <Yeah>. on down. <laughs> All right. Excellent stuff. I really appreciate all you guys. Excellent discussion on the show tonight. Uh, c cannot thank you enough. Truly appreciate all your, all your uh, contributions. Uh, let's see. You can leave your feedback by commenting on the YouTube video or leaving us a review in iTunes. We really appreciate it when people do that. Uh, it helps other people decide whether they want to listen to the show. So, uh, you know, if you feel so inclined, please leave us you a review. You can also go to Google Image Search, find pictures of Sean, and take them to Photoshop and make them sexually explicit and embarrassing. <laughs> Well, that happens more than I'm comfortable with it. Uh, there are plenty of pictures floating around, and I wasn't even in college, and I didn't need the money. So I don't even know what's going on there. But yeah, all kinds of stuff there. You can find that. You can check out our advertisers, Patriot Patch Company at patriotpatch.co, manticorearms.com. Coupon code is TWG10. Uh, you can go to firearmsradio.tv to find This Week in Guns and all the other fine podcasts that are served there. And as we always say, guys, This Week in Guns is produced by Kenny Ortega and is a production of the Firearms Radio Network. We'll see you next week.